Linus might have some competition from NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huan, who today hosted his GTC 2020 keynote from his kitchen. So he's going for the old Linus kitchen set look, as opposed to the build a kitchen in your office look. And the keynote focused on Ampere, NVIDIA's new architecture and the launch thereof. There are a lot of points to go through today. NVIDIA's GTC events are typically focused on data center, deep learning, AI, things of that nature, but a lot of the technology comes to gaming, and there was explicit mention of gaming technologies at NVIDIA's GTC 2020 keynote this year, including, of course, RTX and uh, some mention of DLSS as well. So we're going to talk through all of it today, including Ampere and its data center installment right now, and how that will come down to gaming later. Before that, this video is brought to you by CD Projekt Red and the Cyberpunk 2077 PC modding contest. The Cyberpunk 2077 team is hosting a case modding contest that gives winners the opportunity to work with professional case modders to build the ultimate system. You don't have to do any physical modding to enter the contest, just a mock-up with three views of the mod. The theme is the future is recyclable. The contest ends on May 17th, and Cyberpunk's team will select five winners to partner with pro case modders to make it a reality. Learn more and enter the contest using the link in the description below or go to cyberpunk.net slash cyberup. Based on keynotes from NVIDIA in the past, we end up with things like a Volta Touring situation where Volta wasn't really, it technically had a deployment in the Titan V, but for the most part, it wasn't really a type of card our audience would buy. Touring did end up picking up where Volta left off though, and so Ampere is probably going to be a scenario where it looks like there's going to be a direct gaming deployment of the Ampere architecture, as opposed to something like a Volta Turing split, but we'll find out later in the year for that. It's still relevant though, and going through the initial installment of Ampere is going to be important for setting the stage for what NVIDIA is working on for the rest of the year. We ended up watching all of the company's uploads. It had uh, about eight at the time of filming to its YouTube channel, and we thought that it was going to be a live streamed pre-recorded video, but instead they just ended up doing a straight upload with eight parts. Admittedly, it was at times difficult to listen to because the editing was pretty rough. There were a lot of correction phrases that were thrown and spliced into it where obviously... Now, Ampere is the largest, most complex processor the world has ever made. Thousands of engineers worked on it for several years and it came together in this one incredible chip. Someone decided that they wanted to add clarifying statements into an existing cut. And as we know from recording, you record voiceover at different times of the day and your voice sounds different. So we can pick it out, but for the most part, it doesn't really matter. It's just a keynote. Uh, all right, so there wasn't a lot of RTX news. Let's start with the gaming stuff. I'll timestamp it hopefully below. And there was some RTX news where the company mostly reminded everyone of DLSS and its existence. It showed off DLSS 2.0 again. This was not an announcement of DLSS 2.0. That's already been announced. And from the deployments we've seen so far, it is genuinely improved over DLSS and its original deployments, and even the more recent 1.9 or whatever it was. Juan acknowledged that, quote, most people didn't think this would work, speaking of DLSS and showing the initial blurrier installation of it. And he even acknowledged that, quote, the first generation was a little bit blurry. And it, it really was. So it's good to see that NVIDIA is self-aware. NVIDIA claimed that DLSS 2.0 did a better job than 1080p native did. Uh, we'd assume talking about 720p DLSS. Regarding RTX and ray tracing products, it was mostly re-emphasis of the product stack and the focus of ray tracing in terms of just concept and getting it into gaming more. No new RTX cards today, not really that surprising. They said, quote, when we launched, people were skeptical, but now it's here. And just to be fair here, People were skeptical because when NVIDIA launched, the RTX cards were dying left and right. We had viewers send us like 13 or 14 or 16 or a lot of RTX cards that were dead. And uh, also to be fair, when you launched NVIDIA, it was about 55 days until the first RTX game came out for a card that had RTX in the name. This is another marketing issue where just like what AMD has done, you end up in a scenario where you're marketing a product on something with, at launch at least, for RTX, questionable existence. So the naming really mattered there. That's why people were skeptical. To give NVIDIA credit, absolutely they are correct that DLSS 2.0 is massively improved, and RTX in a lot of ways is has finally gotten wider spread in gaming. Look at Control for a better implementation of it, or Minecraft for a look at uh, the most recent implementation that we've tested. 
Omniverse. NVIDIA talked about its Omniverse solution, which is an RTX server filled with RTX 8000 quadros. None of these feature new GPU architecture. The company showed off a fully playable physics-based ball game, uh, kind of like Spectra Ball or other classics. Camera movements in that were somewhat nauseating to watch. It was really hard to look at, but the graphics were the focal point. And you can look at the demo on their channel if you want. NVIDIA Amp here is the big one here. So NVIDIA did its usual world's largest GPU announcement. You've likely seen the Jensen pulling a video card out of his oven clip that circulated the other day, and that's what this was. NVIDIA Ampere and the A100 processor board is what got the unveil in uh, Jensen's kitchen. And this is built for data center and enterprise use, and it isn't a gaming product, clearly, but it is something that will eventually feed into them, and it's worth covering just because it's a major advancement in its respective space. We learned more about that board in today's video keynote. The A100 processor board weighs 50 pounds. It hosts eight GPUs via the new NVLink 600 gigabyte per second interface, and it has six switches. Some additional interesting facts that were thrown in just for fun include one kilometer of copper traces connecting all the hardware and one million drill holes to hold it all together. That last fact isn't much of a surprise given how much NVIDIA likes its screws and RTX cards. But NVIDIA also noted that it's comprised of over 30,000 components, so those were some busy SMT lines. And it also noted, quote, that it has the most transistors on one computer ever made. NVIDIA's Ampere also features a new MIG architecture, or multi-instance GPUs for elastic GPU computing. After a somewhat strained rocket ship analogy, Juan ended up explaining that MIG allows each A100 GPU to be split into up to seven instances. So you can run it as one GPU or as any subset of one to seven. And most cards, as they're used now, are typically in a one GPU solution, but not sure if virtualization is the correct terminology to be used here, but it's sort of virtualizing uh, seven instances isolated for applications or isolated users in those instances. For data center, the implication is that you can have down-costed access to less computing hardware for applications that don't need as much horsepower, or you can run standalone GPU uh, solutions to host a, a higher-end user. And they're just sub-users on a card, so if you're Amazon, you may end up doing something like selling six instances to a major AI company and then selling one instance to a university student or something like that. Ampere's focus is on inference and training, and the partitioning into smaller GPUs seemingly is its primary selling point other than the just direct speed improvement over the previous generation's NV100. NVIDIA says that data centers can be architected such that smaller GPU partitions are used for scale-out applications or that larger GPU instances are used for scale up applications. This is out of our coverage scope, so we're just giving you the keywords, and if you work in this area, hopefully that means something to you. For those in our audience who may do more artificial intelligence, deep learning, or machine learning applications, we know there's a few of you, we'll go through some of the stats that NVIDIA pre presented in its keynote today. NVIDIA's performance slide had only the data labels for peak performance, but most of the peaks were close enough to the sustained average. And at Gamers Nexus, we admittedly aren't sure exactly what researchers for this type of card want in specs anyway. It's not our coverage area. But uh, for the numbers given, NVIDIA claims that A100 FP64 double precision performance is 20 teraflops versus 8 on V100 Volta with FP64. Assuming the same approach to measuring that number, that's obviously a big jump, but how that translates to real world performance will hinge on the application. Again, in the world of gaming, at least, it's certainly not linear to go from T-flops translating into something like FPS or frame times, but we aren't sure exactly the deployments here. The TensorFlow performance was listed as 16 teraflops on the V100 or uh, for FP32 TensorFlow, or 160 on the A100, and sparse data optimization at 310 teraflops for peak FP32 TensorFlow. For FP16, NVIDIA noted the A100 sparse data performance at 625, non-sparse performance at 310 teraflops, and V100 at 125. NVIDIA separately noted that most people use FP32 for their work in the space, and so it focuses on FP32 and not FP16. Int8, or integer 8 performance, has NVIDIA claiming that the A100 is, quote, the first processor over one petaflop, marking the A100 at 1250 teraflops 
peak for sparse, 625 non-sparse, and using the V100 at 60 teraflops for int8 as a reference point. NVIDIA also used a speech recognition demo to identify birds based on the sounds they made, primarily using this as an example of how the instances process data when split or combined on the A100 cards. With all seven MIGs working as a single GPU, just as a reference point, NVIDIA noted 500 queries per second, whereas it compared this to Volta's 80 queries per second for the same application. The next major announcement was DGX, which is NVIDIA's mini supercomputer that it sells to business and enterprise and data center clients. We've actually seen parts of the definitely not DGX being made at the definitely not Cooler Master factory as well, and the new one features the same gold mesh faceplate as the previous generation of DGX. NVIDIA's new DGX A100 solution is the third installment of its DGX line. It's had two before this. NVIDIA says that it's been optimizing for training, data analytics, and for inference. And because the DGX has eight of the NVIDIA A100 GPUs, it can be split into 56 instances for simultaneous users, or it can be used as eight GPUs, if you want to do it that way. The machine has nine Mellanox CX6 interconnects, this is worth pointing out just because NVIDIA only recently acquired Mellanox and merged, or at least, well, ate Mellanox. It wasn't, I was going to say merged, but didn't really do that. They just consumed it. Uh, their NICs are at 200 gigabits per second. And for CPUs, NVIDIA has tapped AMD's 64-core Epic Rome processors. It's got two of them in the new DGX version 3, and those are running uh, 128 cores total for each DGX box, including one terabyte of memory between them for system memory. The new NVLink also makes an appearance, again, at 600 gigabytes per second. Really important note here, NVLink in these applications is not the same as that bridge that you get for gaming cards. NVLink for gaming is still using SLI in terms of its architecture, but NVLink and Data Center is dealing with a lot more data going across the bridge. So when they say new 600 gigabyte per second NVLink, don't think you're going to get a 600 gigabyte per second NVLink bridge for gaming because it's not going to need all that data. They're already at cut down rates for the existing deployments. And that's what makes them so much cheaper for gaming versus for the professional bridges you can buy. So other specs on DGX include 15 terabytes of PCIe NVMe storage. Uh, for SSD storage and 4.8 terabytes per second of bi-directional bandwidth. The DGX will cost $199,000, making it actually pretty significantly cheaper than previous DGXs we've seen where they've been 400 grand, for example. And if you felt buyer's remorse from the 2070 Super launch about buying an RTX 2080 and maybe being able to have spent $200 less if you had waited a few months, uh, imagine being the guy who bought a $400,000 mini supercomputer and then hearing that the new one's 200 grand. <laughs> NVIDIA gave an example of a 25 rack AI data center priced at $11 million estimated and said it required, in this example, 630 kilowatts to run, noting it had 50 DGX1 systems. So that's not the most recent, but two generations ago with 600 CPU systems for inference and said that that's compared to the newest DGX A100 solution, which would be $1 million for one rack at 28 kilowatts with a major space reduction. NVIDIA used the PageRank algorithm as a benchmark here and the common crawl data set to test performance of the two devices, noting 2.6 terabytes of data and 128 billion edges, calling this a small fraction of the internet. They're definitely correct on that. NVIDIA said that it usually takes 3,000 servers and 105 racks the same time to analyze 52 billion edges per second versus four DGX A100s via NVLink, combining them to one giant DGX, basically, as, a, as Jensen Huan described it, to process 688 billion edges per second. Huan then made the usual, the more you buy, the more you save comment, but this time kind of laughed at himself, so he's apparently in on the joke now. NVIDIA also announced its NVIDIA EGX A100 solution, and this seems to have a heavier focus on security and authenticated boot and IoT to some extent. EGX has a Mellanox Connect X6 network card that's integrated onto the PCB, onto the A100. And this solution is 100 gigabit per second Ethernet or InfiniBand on board solution. The two together are what differentiate this as EGX as opposed to the other A100 deployments that we've seen in NVIDIA's keynote today. It noted that its focus for these is on automation and advancement in training and uh, highlighted that it's got a partnership with BMW now where NVIDIA provided some stats that are actually kind of interesting for 
car enthusiasts where they said Nvidia builds 40 car models with 100 options every day. It apparently imports 30 million parts to do this across 2,000 suppliers, distributes those to apparently 30 factories, and then uh, referenced just-in-time manufacturing where new crates of parts are dropped off as the old ones are getting emptied. And it's almost, at least this, the assembly part is almost entirely done by automation at this point or human-assisted automation. So this is all done to assemble one car in 56 seconds, which is insane for a number of reasons, but that's really more of a BMW stat than it is an NVIDIA stat. Either way, NVIDIA is partnering with BMW, USPS, and some others for robotics and automation training. So that'll be an interesting, interesting thing to watch uh, videos of. If you like to see robots doing stuff, they have some clips of it in their keynotes about this. That'll cover us for all of NVIDIA's announcements for GTC 2020. The big one's obviously Ampere. It is not currently a solution that we're going to be getting here in overclocking or working with for gaming tests, but it's something that should lead into the next gaming architecture, which is definitely due out this year for uh, another RTX, probably 3000 series launch as everyone's calling it right now. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more as always. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus or store.gamersnexus.net to help us out directly. And we'll see you all next time. <laughs>